All right, dude, we are live. What's up, guys? This is Damn Keys, and today we are getting back to fucking neural net. No, we're not getting. Ugh, wow. Okay. I meant we're getting back to neural networks. I just it came out. Whatever. So we are we are we're getting back to we're getting back to doing neural network stuff in PyTorch. Um. So. What was I going to say? My <laughs> That was a weird slip up to have at the beginning of the stream. Okay, anyway, so um I realized that we've kind of strayed far away from the objective, which I mean, to be honest, there weren't that there wasn't just one objective. With me there's usually multiple objectives because I'm doing multiple different things at any given time, right? Cutane, welcome to the stream. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Um, we are going to be studying or continuing studying neural networks today because I realized that um, with all of the data science stuff that I've been doing using scikit-learn and the little uh, detour that I took with um with matrix multiplication and stuff like that it it kind of took me away from pytorch i don't really mind a detour but it you know it i should get back to what i was initially doing and yeah that's what that's what we are doing now so we are going to get back to um pytorch and uh, we're going to finish this this tutorial hopefully uh, this section was diving into building the neural network. Uh, the next section says autograd. Uh, so I'm guessing in the next section, we are actually going to be doing um, the optimization of the weights. Or rather, I should say the, the, the training. The training process to decide the, the optimal weights for the network. Uh, that's where Autograd comes in because Autograd is the the system that um, that keeps track of of the changes and does the calculations and stuff. It it uh, the the calculation of gradients and all is also part of this. It's also part of uh, the Autograd system, and based on those gradients, um, the weights are changed so that in the next iteration we can have you know a different result a different hopefully better result so we're going to be we're going to be looking into that section as well for now we need to finish building the network from start to finish there is one section here okay so um i created a new notebook here uh in here i need to import a couple of PyTorch things. So there was the the data. Do I have the data set here? I, I think I did import. Uh, I think I did copy the data set because I didn't I didn't want to have to re-download the entire data set since especially since I had the files already. Um this is yeah, okay, cool. So uh, here's what we are going to do. We're going to start by um, pulling the data. So we had the training data and then we had the test data as well. So, okay, I'm kind of glad, I'm kind of glad that we took, uh, um, took the little detour with, uh, with other data science stuff because it kind of, it kind of made me more comfortable with, with, um, looking at data as training data and test data. Because uh, I did linear regression using training data and test data. And, oh, yeah, dude. Okay, Kaggle. I, I just remembered. I need to get back to Kaggle as well. Uh, I want to I try my best to submit... Uh, submit an entry for this month's Kaggle competition. I think, I think it's a simple uh, linear regression problem. But uh, after reading the thing, I'll find out more about what exactly, what what problem we are trying to solve. But yeah, I do wanna, I do wanna get back into 
uh, doing Kaggle stuff as well. Uh, I just I just remembered that because what led me to trying to go and understand uh, linear regression was that Kaggle had introduced me to decision tree uh, regression, which is a different form of regression. It doesn't necessarily follow um, it doesn't necessarily follow linear regression, where linear regression. How do I even explain what? Okay, so where linear regression tries to build a line of best fit, a line that best represents the the linear relationship between um, between the data that you're providing, or rather, it tries to best represent a linear relationship between the target variable and any input data, any input variables that, that you are giving it. It tries to model a linear relationship between between those two groups using the line of best fit. And that line of best fit is not limited to just uh, just two dimensions. It can also be in higher dimensions. So, you know, three, four, five, six dimensions and so on. Of course, um, with with higher dimensions, it's not going to be it's not always going to be possible to visualize the line. Um, but up to three dimensions, you can definitely visualize it. Maybe you can try to visualize the fourth dimension uh, using color. But the thing is, there's there's only so far you can go with that. Either way, okay. So where linear regression tries to model the relationship using this line of best fit method, uh, decision tree regression apparently does it in a different way by by building some kind of tree structure. I haven't I haven't gone deep into that, but I do wanna I do wanna explore that as well. That's kind of why I got distracted with uh, with scikit learn because there's there's a bunch of things that you can learn. Um, just by looking at the documentation of, of scikit-learn, there's a lot of uh, different stats related and machine learning related uh, algorithms that you're going to come across. And there's, okay, so I also need to look into classification algorithms. So far, I've looked into uh, regression algorithms. I also want to explore classification stuff to help uh, categorize data and classify data. I want to see, I want to see how that works as well. So, okay, something that I wanna do once I have uh, enough knowledge with various ML and stats related regression and classification techniques and enough knowledge of neural networks is I wanna, I wanna try and solve a problem using those stats and ML methods, and then I want to try and solve that same problem using neural networks. So I want to try and apply both of these techniques to one problem uh, and see how they differ. I feel like trying to apply uh, different problems to neural, or rather, I should say it the other way, trying to apply neural networks to different problems is going to teach me a lot about neural networks and the different the different types of neural networks as well. But I also want to explore uh, other algorithms. I want to try and apply other techniques to specific problems and see how that differs from applying neural networks. There's still so much more that I have to learn in terms of neural networks, which is why I decided to come, you know, I decided to pause the, uh, pause the scikit-learn thing that I was doing and just get back, get back on track um with pytorch i just lost my train of thought what was i saying okay whatever so um i'm i'm getting back i'm getting back on track with uh with pytorch uh so far we are learning about feed forward neural networks we've been stuck on that for a while um to be fair i have learned quite a bit since then because there was this thing that i was trying to do back then where I was trying to do the calculations manually, but um, not not exactly doing the math manually, uh, just 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 separating the operations. I was trying to do the operations individually, 
versus setting up an entire network in a class, like setting up an entire network structure in a class and then passing the data through that. Um, I wanted to be able to use each of each of the functions, stuff like linear, ReLU, and stuff like that, individually to see what the difference would be, like to to to, to get an understanding of how each of these methods work. And uh, I'm kind of glad that I, I I explored that route because that led me to finding, uh, what was it? I think it was, wait, do I not have PyTorch here? No, I created it. I created a data science thing. Did I create this without PyTorch? Okay, so I have scikit-learn here. Hold up, hold up. Because uh, I had set up a separate thing without PyTorch. That was the data science thing, though. I don't, I don't think it was this. Uh, would it be under scripts? I think I'm not sure. No, wait. I wanna, I wanna look at the library. Oh, okay, fine, dude. The, the, the simplest, the simplest thing that I could do is. Uh, just just do pip freeze and get all of the get all of the installed packages. Oh, I also just realized that oh that that might be that might be the reason why. Thank you, Qtane. A appreciate it. Thank you. Uh I just realized that it might be because I haven't selected this. So I'm, okay, uh, now that that has showed up, uh, let's do scripts, activate. Okay, now that that's activated, pip3 freeze, and we send this into requirements.txt. So that should give us a requirements file, which is here. Hold on. I see Dynamo export. Yes. Okay. So we should have PyTorch. I think the issue was just that I hadn't uh, selected the, the environment that it should be running in. There's Torch. Okay. We have PyTorch installed here. Great. Awesome. Is it supposed to be PyTorch or just Torch? Oh, it's supposed to be just Torch. Okay, that's my bad. So what I was trying to show, what I was trying to mention earlier was that um, trying to do each of the each of the steps manually, it introduced me to uh, this module called nn.functional or functionals, I think. Just functional, okay. Uh, and this this module contains a bunch of the methods that you would find in in uh, torch.nn. Uh, so let's say we, like the most basic one, let's say we have nn.linear. There's a functional equivalent of that called fn. Uh, I think that's also just linear, right? These so uh, these are two separate things. Now the the difference here is that the first one is differentiable, uh, meaning you can actually use it to you can use it when you're developing a network where you're going to be using uh, Autograd to to calculate the gradients and stuff like that. But you don't do that with this. You don't do that with the the functional equivalent. Um, another interesting thing is that. When you are when you are declaring a layer, a linear layer using nn.linear, you don't usually specify weights. Um, you don't usually. I mean, there's there's a way. If you want to do custom weight initialization, there is a way. If you wanna if you wanna set the weights manually, there is a way to go about doing that. But you don't directly set the weights. Um, whereas with fn.linear, I mean it's functional.linear, but I've I've set it as fn. If you look at this method, not only do you specify the input, but you also specify the weights and the bias. Uh, if if you look at the the differentiable or yeah, if you look at the differentiable version, 
Uh, in here, you, you mainly only specify the in features, the out features, and whether there's supposed to be a bias. Usually you don't specify the, the weights and, and uh, the biases. Uh, those get initialized randomly, but there, there, is, there, is, um, there are certain techniques that are used to select even those random weights from, from what I understand. Uh, and then throughout, throughout your training process, those weights get changed. Uh, over and over again. The, the weights and biases get changed over and over again. Uh, none of that happens with fn.linear, at least, at least according to my understanding. So I'm kind of glad that I, I explored, I tried to explore, you know, doing these steps individually versus just doing everything as one class. Uh, what else was there? There was also, I think it was called datasets or what was it called? Hold on. Let me let me uh, tab into this. What was it? Data. Oh, torch torch vision. Torch vision has uh, the data sets. So so the good news is that with uh, with PyTorch you do have a couple of data sets that that come available with it. Uh, you would have to download them. I don't know. I don't know how many of them are just part of the the package itself. Most of them, I think, you have to download because they are um, they aren't necessarily PyTorch's datasets, from what I understand. But they are datasets that are available, and uh, PyTorch has created classes that use those datasets. Uh, I feel like the the Fashion MNIST dataset is one example, but I can't really talk a whole lot about it because. I don't know too much about it. From what I have understood, I don't think the MNIST dataset is theirs. Um, it's it's from elsewhere, but we are allowed to use it. Um, I think I think no, I think PyTorch does have no. Yeah, I take that back. I think PyTorch does have their own datasets as well. Uh, I don't think the the Fashion MNIST dataset is theirs. Yeah, I think I think that was the case because now that I'm now that I'm uh, thinking back, I do remember seeing some datasets that were that were ma made by PyTorch. I don't I don't know if they're still part of the PyTorch library. Um, I'm gonna have to check. Either way, okay, doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, regardless, we are we are able to be able to use the the datasets, so that's great. And uh, for for datasets for how do i say this for for specific data sets they have they have these classes created where you can you can load the data set and then there's also a data loader so you can you can load the data set um and access it in a more structured manner so you you get like a class and you get a bunch of different variables to to be able to access the data in different ways it's not you're not just getting a raw numpy array um that numpy array would be divided into you know various different parts or rather the numpy array itself is available but also different parts of that numpy array are available to you uh through different fields of the class um let me show you what i mean it's it's somewhere here no i should go into data sets and data loaders that's a that's a good that gives a good bit of information right so here we can see um So this is how we load the training data. Uh, you can specify where it's supposed to look for the data set. And you can specify, I, I don't remember what the train part is supposed to be. Uh, I think it's, I think it decides which portion of the data set it's going to be using because some portion of it is meant to be training data and some portion is meant to be uh, test data. Though I'm not sure how they're deciding that because I remember looking at the neural network code and there was also this thing of loading data in batches which is kind of interesting like we're gonna we're gonna be looking into that as well 
loading data in batches and training on those batches of data versus the entire data set versus training on like the entire data set at once uh then then there's this option as well for uh uh, whether it should be downloaded or not. In my case, I don't want it to be downloading because I'm streaming and I don't want, you know, uh, the thing to start downloading while I'm streaming. So fortunately, I've already downloaded the thing in another project, so I just copied the files over and now I have the data set. And then there's also transform to tensor. So I guess that just means that the, the entire data is going to be available as a tensor as opposed to, I don't know what, I don't know if it would be available as a, like, let's say you didn't transform it. Would it be like a pandas data frame or a numpy or that's okay. Hold on. That's a, that's a good, we can, we can check that out. Right. So let's try importing this. Um, cause we're going to need to import this later on as well. So we're going to, we're going to just do a quick, a quick little detour again, or a quick little refresher from torch.utilities.data import data set okay import uh data set all right wait this is the wrong data set this is what i'm looking for Okay, then we have from torch vision import data sets from torch vision dot transforms import to tensor and then matplotlib as well. Okay, cool. Uh, from torch dot no torch vision uh, import. What are we importing? What are we importing from here? Data sets. Okay. Data sets. And then from torch vision dot transforms import to tensor. Oh, I like that they have a thing for uh, to PIL image as well. I should I should import I should import that as well. Uh, maybe I could then easily convert like the the because the the data is um the data is mentioned as colors color values um though i mean to be fair um because i was about to i was about to say that maybe converting it to a pil image would make it easy to pass it into matplotlib and display it as an image but i think even otherwise it would it would still be easy to just pass in a bunch of colors. Matplotlib allows that. I've done that. Have I done that? No, I did that on I did that on pillow. I don't remember if I did that with Matplotlib specifically. Um okay. Import matplotlib dot plots as PLT. Okay, that's done. Wait. Do I not have matplotlib installed? Oh shit, okay. Let's do that, I guess. pip3 install, matplotlib. I think I installed it recently, so there should be a cached version. I don't know if it's going to find the cached version, but even if it doesn't, I don't think matplotlib is that big. So we shouldn't have that much of an issue. While that installs, we can go back to the documentation. Okay, so uh, here we create a training data object and then we load the data set into that. There was a data loaders thing. Was that a separate object? I don't remember that. Iterating and visualizing that. Okay, so this is the data loader. I'm, I'm assuming this is the data loader. Um, it gives you the labels. I believe these labels were also part of the, so this is what I was talking about. The, the class that, so fashion MNIST, for example, they, they made this class to represent the data set. And it's not just the data set. It's not just the array. Um, it gives you 
it gives you various fields that are useful for different purposes. So th there is one field I do remember. There is one field for labels. I think it was called classes. I don't remember. But there there is a field that gives you uh, this data alone, like this these strings alone. There's uh, there's also another field that gives you a dictionary like like this. Um, there were a couple of different fields, and of course there's also uh, there's also ways to access just the image data. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, we have sample, okay, okay, image, label. Oh, yeah, okay, so when you access the first dimension, or how, how should I say this? This would technically be dimension zero, right? So if you access dim one or dim zero, would this be wait? Would this be dim zero or would the innermost thing be dim zero? I think this would be dim zero. Like the outermost thing is dim zero, and then it goes, it goes inwards and inwards and inwards. I think so. I think so. Uh, so yeah, when you when you access dim one or dim zero in uh, in the training data array or in the training data object that gets returned it gives you a bunch of information like per like it gives you information per so in this case it's giving you one label and one image oh god i just clicked on that okay let's go back because this is about to load something else yeah so uh when you try to access this it gives you a tuple which is uh, a label and the image associated with that label and uh here okay here we're just doing our oh we're we're adding we're adding subplots to the figure so that we can then display multiple images i think that's what's going on yeah that's what's going on so that's why they have the label i'm, I'm guessing there's going to be a text thing as well no they, they use title plt.title and then so this is just a way to show show multiple images that's okay i think i think uh i think Pillow is there, so I could probably just display. Or or I could use I am show. I need to look into the squeeze method. I don't remember what the squeeze method does. Um, but I'm guessing it's part of the this thing. I think it just lays it out linearly, right? Or no, no, no. I think I think it gets rid of one of the dimensions. Yeah, I think I think that's what it does. Hold on, hold on. Uh, let's say, uh, let's type in here. So, hold on, what's going on? Oh, it's just my system being slow. Okay, cool. So, squeeze. Uh, there's torch.squeeze. This returns a tensor with all the specified dimensions of input of size one rem. Oh, God. Okay. Hold on. What is this saying? For example, if input is of shape A multiplied by 1, multiplied by B, multiplied by C, multiplied by 1, multiplied by D. Input of size 1 removed. It, it returns a tensor with all specified dimensions. Dude, I need to... I need to my god hold on i need to i need to experiment a bit wait is this not done yet it's done okay so what's what's the problem oh it's just pi plot not pi plots wait a sec oh my god you're joking matplotlib was already installed the issue was this that I wrote pi plots instead of pi plot. This is so dumb. Okay, anyways, um, so let's say TO1 equals, equals what? Um, is it nn.tensor or torch? It's, it's torch.tensor, so let's do um, import torch as tch, okay. Also, let's, uh, let's have this on its own cell, all, all of these statements on their own cell. And let's create a new cell so that I'm not importing each time. 
Okay, so let's say TO1 equals um, TCH dot tensor. What is tensor expected? Is this not how we create a tensor? Am I missing something here? No, no, this is how this is how we create a tensor. I remember. So let's say this and then this um, and then that. Okay, great, cool. So I want to print out this tensor's shape. Uh, the shape is supposed to be 2 by 2 by 3. If I'm reading this right, I think it, yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be um, two by two by three, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, two, right? So that's the outer dimension. That's dim zero, and then each row in that has has two, and that's dim one. And then within that, each row has three columns. So, oh shit, I missed the add timer. All right, so there's gonna be an add starting in some time in like maybe 10, 15, 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, for some reason, the stream froze. No, 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 we're good, we're good. Okay, so yeah, it should be two, two, three. Um, and then we print out the data for this as well. All right, uh, let's wait for the results. Yeah, so the, the thing here is two, two, three. All right, for the sake of introducing a one, in there because apparently it just removes single dimension stuff so here that's not what i was trying to do oh shit okay there's there's an ad playing so i'll see you guys in 30 seconds i'll take a hydration break or something All right, welcome back. So uh, this is not what I was trying to do. Um, I was trying to do something else. I was trying to do this. I was trying to introduce a one within this shape. So now the shape has changed to two by one by six. So what I'm expecting here is that if I squeeze this, it's gonna remove the dimension and then just give us two by six. Let's see if that happens. So print t zero dot squeeze, I guess. Okay, did that do it? Yes, yes, it did. It did exactly that. So it just removes it just removes single dimensions, which is which is useful because, like in some situations, you might end up with data sets that have uh, unnecessary extra dimensions. Uh, let's print out the shape of that as well. Yeah, there it is. So you can see the shape previously was two by one by six, and that got squeezed into. So uh, that being said, I need to f I need to see why we are squ oh what just happened. Something just happened with my internet. Is is the is the stream still running? Give me give me a second. Okay, stream seems to be running. We haven't dropped any frames either. 
fortunately, we haven't dropped any frames. Um, give me a second. I'm just refreshing everything, and it seems like we are fine. Okay, it was a small hiccup. All right, cool. Awesome. So, uh, back to back to what I was saying, doing, back to what I was doing. So we want to try and load. Okay, so we're going to load the training data first. Uh, what was it? Datasets dot passion mnest. And this is great because they have a bunch of different data sets from what I remember. A bunch of different data sets for us to play around with. Like there's a couple, there's a couple of them here, and I'm going to be using all of them. Well, not <laughs> there's no way that I can use every single one of them, but I'm definitely going to be using multiple ones. What the fuck is flying chairs, dude? Um, data set for optical flow. I'm interested in this. What is the flying? What is the flying chairs data set? Hold on. So let's go to Fashion Mnist and try and trace back from there. Oh, actually, let's look at the code here. Uh, let's look at datasets, I guess. Okay, dataset is not clickable here. So let's try this. No, I need I, I need to like go one step above Fashion Mnist. What what is what is Fashion Mnist a part of? Datasets? I think I think datasets, yeah. Fashion Mnist is a part of datasets. Uh built in datasets. All datasets are subclasses of um of so and so. I.e., they have get item and len methods implemented, hence they cannot so this is what I was trying to explain earlier is that the, the data sets, what we call data sets are, well, actual sets containing data, right? Those data sets can be, they, those data sets are usually represented as, as data frames or NumPy arrays or uh, even a tensor for that matter. But those data sets get wrapped into a data set class in PyTorch. So that way you have a more structured way of of working with this data sets. You, you with well with these this. Okay, so I mixed up this and these and then data set and data sets. That way you have a more structured way of working with these data sets. Uh you're not just working with the raw data. Of course, those those data sets they are wrapping the raw data. So eventually you are going to be getting to the raw data, but it gives you a more structured way of, of working with these da these various data sets. And the great thing is that PyTorch exposes, um, exposes this class so that you can also uh, you can also use it for your own data sets. So you can you can structure your own data sets using this class. Okay, okay. So we have data sets. Um, all our subclasses, okay, okay. Hence, they can all be passed to a data loader. So this comes in later on. And that's where we do the batches and stuff like that. Okay, I need to look, I need to look into that. Um, data loader, which can load multiple samples in parallel using multiprocessing workers. Oh, okay, so that's something I didn't know. So this this thing right here gives me incentive of wrapping incentive for wrapping um, any data set that I have into an actual data set class. Because if I'm then able to pass that data set into the data loader and the, the loading will be done using some form of parallelism, um, that's a reason for me to wrap it in in the data set class. Um, okay, all the data sets have almost similar API. They all have two common arguments, transform and target transform to transform the input and target specifically. Okay, 
Uh, you can also create your own data sets using the provided base classes. So this is what I was uh, talking about, where you can create your own data sets. All right, so here are all of the data sets. Um, you have a bunch of them, not just for image classification. There's also for uh, audio and also for text. I don't know if that's mentioned on this page or not. So there's image detection or segmentation. Okay. What is optical flow? I need to I need to look into that. Hold on, hold on. I'm curious about this. You know what I should do? Uh maybe I should open up um I should open up perplexity. Cuz I'm a lot more comfortable with typing something into the LLM versus typing into my search bar. Uh, when I'm trying to ask a question. So I'm going to open up labs.perplexity.ai, I think it was. I don't remember. Okay, let me just Google it. Perplexity Labs. So the great thing about this is it gives you, it gives you access to a bunch of different, uh, I believe, all open source models. I don't remember how many are still in their list, but for a certain period of time, they had like, they had like a big list. Hold on, not like a massive list, but it, it was still a couple of different uh, LLM models that you could use. And even now, you have you have a you have a couple of different choices. Most of them being Llama. Previously, there were a couple of others as well. Uh, I don't know if they've locked them behind accounts. Like you have to create an account and then you'll be able to use all of the models or if they just removed a bunch of the models that they noticed were not being used. I need to look into what liquid LFM is, like which, what kind of model it is. For the time being, we're just going to use this one because this works perfectly fine. Uh, I do also want to try, okay, so I do, I want to, I want to play around with the Llama model, but the issue that I run into is each time I look at anything llama related it always seems like the weights are not not necessarily locked behind but technically yes locked behind some kind of form like they're willing to give you the weights but you have to fill out a form for that so that's that's kind of what stops me from doing it not that i'm you know completely against doing that it it just seems just seems a little i'm not willing to put that effort in to to get the weights if i'm just gonna get the weights um just like that then i'm okay with it otherwise otherwise also it's fine um for the time being i can i can look into other smaller llm models or i could look into the older llama models if if those are not locked behind because initially those were also locked behind forms um, you had the first Llama model, which had certain limitations, but it was it was available uh, once you filled out the form. Um, and then you had Llama 2, which again had a similar thing. I don't remember at what point they removed the commercial use restriction. Um, actually, I don't... I'm trying to remember if Llama still has the commercial use restriction or not. No, I don't think it does. I think it's it's available for commercial. I don't remember. Okay, don't don't quote me on that. I don't remember if it's available for uh, commercial use or not. That being said, the weights are still locked behind. At least from what I've seen, they they're still behind some kind of form. I'm still looking because recently when I looked at it, I just looked a little bit, and once I ran into that, you know, quote unquote, pay paywall. It's not a paywall. It's I'm it, I'm pretty sure it's free. It's just they want you to fill out a form, and I don't want to fill out a form, so it's just a silly thing on on my part. Um, I'm there are there are a couple of other LLMs that I can look at. Uh, I was I was planning on accessing it through through uh, Hugging Face Transformers, anyways. So. Instead of looking at Llama, I could probably look at some other LLM that's that's hosted on Hugging Face that's available through the Transformers library, and that you know the weights are avail available for. All 
all right um right let's type something into this so uh i'm learning pytorch i came across a data set or an example data set called flying chairs what's with my fucking typos dude okay uh called flying chairs it mentions something about optical flow what is this data set and what is optical flow okay all right let's let this finish All right, the Flying Chairs dataset is a synthetic dataset designed for training and evaluating optical, optical flow estimation algorithms. Here are the key points of this dataset. It consists of 22,000 or close to 23,000 image pairs along with, along with their corresponding ground truth optical flow fields. Uh, the, image show, the images show renderings of 3D chair models moving in front of random backgrounds 3d chair models moving in front of random backgrounds which are sourced from flickr both the chairs and the backgrounds have been purely uh purely planar motions no both the chairs and the backgrounds have purely planar motions i need to I need to look into what planar motion is. Um, structure. The data set is organized into a directory structure where each image pair and its corresponding flow field are stored. For example, the directory may contain files like so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Usage. This data set, or the data set, is used to train convolutional neural networks for optical flow estimation as demonstrated by so-and-so. Okay, what is optical flow? Optical flow is a pattern, is the pattern of apparent motion of objects. Pattern of apparent motion of objects, surfaces, and edges in a visual scene caused by the relative motion between an observer and the scene. Here's a detailed explanation. Definition. Optical flow is a 2D vector field where each vector represents the direction and magnitude of motion of a pixel or a small region in the image between two consecutive frames. Optical flow is the pattern of apparent motion. Okay, okay, hold up. So optical flow is supposed to represent the motion between two things, or the motion between the observer and the image? So this is used for optical flow estimation as demonstrated by us. what is this used for exactly is it meant to like remove is it meant to to remove blurriness to, to stabilize images more so like if you take a if you take if you take a pic and the pic has like or the camera has moved then you know obviously that there's going to be there's going to be like blurriness in there is this meant to is this meant to use these estimations to sort of remove those remove the blurriness from the image dude i should look into this later on cuz apparently this is used for something called flow net It is widely used in computer vision for tasks such as uh, object tracking, motion segmentation, and scene understanding. Optical flow can help in understanding how objects move within a scene, which is crucial for applications like autonomous driving. Oh, this is, okay, this is used for something completely different. Something much more interesting, actually. 
like autonomous driving, surveillance, and robotics. No, that is really interesting, dude. Okay, at some point, once I understand um, convolutional neural networks, I should come back to this. Okay, so this is the flying chairs thing. Right. Why? Oh, I was looking for flying chairs. And, well, I found flying chairs. Kitty flow. Is this flying cats? Well, this could be like movement of cats, basically, right? Okay, okay. Anyways. Let's carry on with... So we had loading the data set and then loading the data from the data set. So let's load the data set using fashion MNIST. Uh, the root is supposed to be, uh, I think it was torch, torch data. So in torch data, we have the thing. And then train is supposed to be, okay, let's say true. What was the next thing? Download. We definitely don't want this to download. Um, transform. So I want to test out what the thing looks like with two tensor and without two tensor. So I'll, of course, with two tensor, I'm guessing it's it's just going to have like the entire thing is going to be wrapped into a tensor, or maybe maybe multiple tensors. Okay, so let's try printing training data dot classes. So this is a list of all of the, the classes in this. Uh, then we have classes to indices. I think this gives us the dictionary. Yes, this gives us the dictionary. Um, and I believe in the data set, um, each of the each of the images has has a corresponding class which is mentioned as um, as a number, as an index, not as the label itself. So let's say we we look at this. Okay, so the first. The first thing returned here is an image. And the last thing returned here is this, nine. Right, so by that logic, I, I could say IMG and label equals training data. Zero. And then I could print out label, which is nine. Okay, so this is our image, right? If we print out this image, why are we trying to squeeze the image? Let's try and understand that. There's not supposed to be any transparency here from what I'm guessing. Uh... Wait, what is the shape of this? So this is all as a tensor, right? Hold on. What if I remove this? What if I don't have this and I run that? Okay, so in that case, it returns uh, a pill image. Or a pillow, a pillow image. Is label still label? Label is still label. Okay. So in this case, it returns the image. I, I should be able to... Do, I don't remember how you access the shape of, okay, would, would this work? Or would I have to do image.data. something? I don't remember how you access uh, pill images uh, dimensions. Yeah, I don't think it has, I don't think it has shape. Okay, so two tensor it is, great. 
And I'm guessing this is why we do the squeeze operation, because what this is saying is that within this hold up so within this array or within this this let's say row we have another row and then we have 28 rows and 28 columns in each row so what we are trying to do so okay we have 28 rows and then 28 columns in each row right or how do i better show this okay so what we are trying to do here is just remove this basically i'm, I'm guessing that's because uh when we are trying to display the thing with matplotlib so let's let's say figure axis and uh what what are we what are we what are we? Oh, yes. PLT dot subplots. And then we are trying to do axis. You know what? Uh, for the time being, let's let's try just showing something. So I am show. Uh, let's create a test image. Test IMG01 equals. Uh, it should just take lists, right? I think I think it should just take lists. Also, I think it's expecting zero to one values, not not zero to two five six. Let me see if it mentions here. Uh, array like or PIL image. Okay, there you go. Oh, that's why it's it's directly a PIL image. So I can just I can just pass the, the pill image directly. Uh, M by N, an image with scalar data. Oh, this could be a 0 to 1 float or a 0 to 255 int. That's M by N by 3. Right, okay. All right, is that is that what I have though? Yeah, yeah. It should okay. It didn't meant no. It didn't actually no. It didn't mention that. It's because it says here. Oh, it doesn't mention it because it's a it's a grayscale thing. How do you does it does it account for grayscale images? Oh, scalar. Okay, and an image with scalar data. Uh, the values are mapped to colors using normalization and a color map. Oh, would I have to specify grayscale? What if I just pass in? Okay, let's uh, let's create a thing here. Let's create a gray image. Okay, uh, let's do. How do I use list comprehension to make this? So I want to do this for x in range, let's say 10. So we'll make a 10 by 10 image, right? And then this for y in range 10. And for the sake of being able to get the shape of it. Wait, can I just pass in a... I don't think I can pass in a tensor. How do I get the shape? Well, it says array-like, right? Wouldn't a tensor be considered an array-like? Okay, let's let's import uh, NumPy here. So import NumPy as NP, run that, and then here... Wait, did that run? Okay. And then here we create a NumPy array. And we try to get the shape of test image 01 dot. Well, we try to get the shape of test image 01. Right, so what's that giving us? That's giving us 10 by 10. Oh, yeah, it's supposed to be 0 0.5. Just 0 0.5. All right. 
What if I do this? Okay. All right. Yeah, that fits. That fits the, the shape that I'm going for. Right. So we can then pass in test image and print it out. That should be a, that is not, that is not a gray image. It uses color map, right? So C map would have to be, I don't know, gray. Should I just say gray or gray scale or? Because I mean, if I, wait, okay. Okay, give it a give, give it a second. That didn't work. I'm guessing gray is a color map, but gray scale is not a valid color map. Supported values are accent and what more? Oh good, it's giving an entire list here. Okay, okay, okay. Dark grays and then grays. Grays are Okay, all right. Okay, let's let's try that. Okay, that is. Doesn't that look more white than gray? Yeah, that looks that looks more white than gray. That definitely looks more white than gray. What if I do 0 0.2? Nope, 0 0.1. Nope, nope. It is still white. Though if I pass it RGB, because right now I'm passing it uh, just, okay. All right, there it is. So there it it respects the color how how is the image being rendered here in this example oh it just uses it just says gray was it was it my spelling cuz i used uh, i did gray with an e fine let's try this and then remove all of this Nah, still. Hold up. Now it's now it's black. That's interesting. So when it squeezes the image, okay. Let's say img dot squeeze dot shape so that shape is supposed to be this uh let's try printing out the data the data is correct the data is 0 0.75 but it's not it's not accepting that yeah that's that's weird i'm i'm not sure what's going on um okay let's try printing out the data for uh this Hold on, I just realized something. Wait, how many are these? Oh, this is a this is a twenty eight by twenty eight thing, right? Yeah, this is a twenty eight by twenty eight thing. So mine is pretty much that. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, mine mine is pretty much that, right? It's uh, that's the shape that I'm looking at. Ten by ten. All right. What if we did twenty-eight by twenty-eight? Oh shit. Let's not do that. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's try this. Nope. Still not working. There's there's something there's some important information that I'm missing here. So if I print out this. It gives it gives me pretty much the same thing as the other. Right? And then we are passing this image into Why isn't it why isn't it working? It it works okay, hold on. Let's read this. An image with scalar data. The values are mapped to colors using normalization and a color map. Okay, my data is already normalized. The first two dimensions define the rows and columns of the image. Uh, out of range values, out of range RGBA values are clipped. Okay. The this parameter is ignored if X is RGBA. Okay, now mind that. All right, you know what? Uh I could I could just pass in image here. And wait. Oh, I need to squeeze it. Let's see what the error is, though, because it is expecting an M by N image. Invalid shape, one by something, something. Okay, yeah. Okay, that works, but my thing doesn't work. That's interesting. What if, what if I made this a, a tensor? Just... Just a shot in the dark. Nope, still nothing. It says it's expecting, or well, it says that the value gets normalized, right? Okay, what if what if we do one? Nothing. Okay, what if we do a hundred? Nothing. That's crazy, dude. Hold on, what if we do 100.0? Nope, nothing. What's going on here? Hold on, I need to I need to look this up. Matplotlib, I am show uh, grayscale image not working. Uh, the array I am is probably a 3D array um, with the shape so-and-so or shape so-and-so. Check I am dot shape. Okay. Uh, C map is ignored if X is 3D. But X is not 3D here. X is... X is 2D. Uh, to use a color map, you'll have to pass a 2D array to, to I am show. You could, for example, plot one, one of the color channels, such as I am so-and-so, or plot the average over the three, uh, the three channels. Yeah, but no, my, my thing is definitely a two...
Hold on. What does what does uh, the data here look like? Zero point this 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 this. Okay. So we do have these kinds of values in there. Okay. Let's try. Let's try doing this. I don't know. Nope, still nothing. That is weird, dude. Because I'm definitely giving it what it's looking for. Okay, let's try 1.0. Try to make it a white image. That's not working either. Okay, what if I remove the color map? If I remove the color map, it uses some kind of... It's using something. There's no change here. There's, dude, I'm missing something. I'm definitely missing something here. Because it's weird that if I pass in image here, oh, image.squeeze, yeah. gives what I'm looking for. But if I create my own thing, it doesn't accept that. What am I missing here, dude? Okay, so this is the tensor. This is one um, one row worth of data. And then another row, and then another row. Okay. And similarly, we have this, which has pretty much the same shape. Yet, it's not printing um, Wait, uh, dot gray is not working and displaying original color. Uh, I am show numpy gray scale not working. Numpy gray scale black. Right. I'm not sure what's going on here. So I'm going to I'm going to move on from this instead of spending more time doing this. Fortunately, the the original thing, the original data set is being displayed, so I don't need to worry about that. I'm still confused as to why the other thing is working but my thing is not working. Um, can I specify like a D type or something? Uh, 
Hold on. What is the D type of this image? Can I get the D type of this image? It says torch.float32. Okay, so what's the D type of this image? This is also torch.float32. Yeah, no. What am I missing here? I'm definitely I'm I'm missing something here. Uh what is wrong with my so and so all black in all black with I am show. Sure. Okay, all right. Somebody asked this question in Matplotlibs in Matplotlibs forum. Uh, and somebody answered here. Matplotlib I am show shows black image, shows black screen. Uh, vmen0, vmen this. While plotting the image, you can set the minimum and maximum value range for I am show. All right, let's, let's try that. vmen, this can be a float, right? So vmen0, 0, 0, vmax, 1.0. You're joking, dude. You've got to be kidding me. How is it how is it that with the other image I don't need to do that? But with this image I need to do that. Yeah, it works. All right, whatever. Let's 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 just carry on. Let's just carry on. Okay, so we are able to load the data set. Once we load the data set, uh, we have iterating and visualizing the data set. We were supposed to be looking into, into neural networks, but we are now looking into this. I don't, I don't think I need to look too deep into it because like it, it goes further into like customizing your own data sets and stuff like that. I don't, I don't need to look into that. I just need to look into using the data set, uh, iterating and visualizing. Uh, I think that's about it, right? Oh yeah, then then there's a data the data loader thing as well. I need to look at that because there. Hold on, is that not mentioned in the neural network thing? Where's here? Is that not being done here? So if initially we are passing in random data. Okay, then, then it goes into the model layers, and then it goes into like explaining each of those layers. Okay, great, awesome. This is actually this is actually what I'm looking for, so that's great. Uh, model parameters, okay. And then that's that. I should have just carried on reading this instead of going to the data set section, but it's cool. I mean, I, I got I got kind of a refresher of uh, data sets and data loading. Actually, I don't I don't yet have a refresher of data loading. Uh, I need to look into the loading part as well, because there was a thing where it's like an iterator. 
uh, you can load the you can load the data in batches and then you can iterate over each of those batches so the entire data set gets divided up into batches at least from from my understanding it gets divided up into batches and then you can iterate over each of those each of those batches so i need to look into that as well that's part of data loading uh data data loader where did they do that in on on this page did they do that on this page i don't know if they did creating a custom data set okay no uh so far they're just loading the data set not loading the data from the data set preparing okay there it is so uh the data set retrieves our data sets features and labels uh one sample at a time while while training our model, we typically want to pass samples in many batches, reshuffle the data at every epoch to reduce model overfitting, and use Python's multiprocessing to speed up the to speed up data retrieval. Data loader is an iterable that abstracts this complexity for us uh, in an easy API. Okay, um, so training data, batch size, and shuffle. Okay, all right. So let's get rid of all of this. We can get rid of all of this as well. Okay. So this is training data. Uh, let's do training data loader. equals data loader training data batch size so and so all right so let's explore this uh data load did i never add that i think oh yeah i don't think i added that is data loader part of this yes great so run that and then we can call data loader pass in training data and specify a batch size of let's make it small let's make it a batch size of four so that i can look at the so, so i can print out the data here and then shuffle equals true now how are we wait let's print the type of training data because it mentions it's an iterator so i can well, iterate over it. Well, this just says data loader. Well, if it's an iterator, then I should be able to iterate over it using for. For i in this, print i. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh shit, I didn't think wait, that's that's interesting. Okay, so it's it's uh it's iterating over wait no, I don't I don't get it. Uh each time it's supposed to return a batch size of four. Oh, so the entire so it creates an iterator containing mini batches and right now i'm iterating over mini batches of four each which is why it's doing this and the fashion mnist data set is i think 60k in size let's stop this where is it let's interrupt this um Uh, what what was it? I think I think dot data dot shape. Yeah, 
it's it's 60 60,000 images so it was just iterating over all of them all right okay we have loaded the data set into the data loader and can iterate through the data set as needed each iteration below returns a batch of train features and train labels containing batch size 64 features and labels respectively okay we can test that out isn't there like a next method that we can call yeah there's a there's a next method kind of thing right oh no we just we just do this so we wrap the iterator into an oh god what did i just do yeah we wrap the iterator into this and then wrap that into next so we can call next on the iterator okay cool great let's just go with that um so let's say data equals actually i should change this to data set and then set and then set so now here i can say train data uh what was it next yeah next iter and training data loader oh okay so it's an iterator internally right so each time each time we call next it's going to iterate internally it's gonna it's gonna iterate so the next time we call next it should give us the next item right hold on uh to test this out let's let's wrap a list into this uh wait list iter equals this all right and then uh we call next on list iter or i could i could just print next iter and then print next and see what it gives yeah there it is so it's uh internally because it's an iterator so internally it's keeping it's keeping count there it is uh so we can do train data uh next iter wait that's kind of interesting how i can wrap something into this says it gets an iterator from an object in the first form the argument must supply its own iterator or be a sequence which is why which is probably why i'm able to pass a list in uh, in the second form in the second form uh the callable is called until what's the second form Okay, in the second form, the callable is called until it returns the sentinel. Okay, I don't know, I don't know what that means. But okay, uh, that being said, I just noticed the time. So it's kind of my fault, I started late. But kind of also not my fault uh, that I started late because um, I had a unity project open and I had some, uh, I had a VS code window open and things just slowed down and it caused like a huge delay so um yeah it is it is what it is that being said i'm i'm happy that i've gotten back on track with the neural network stuff unfortunately i'm gonna have to continue doing this off stream which i'm definitely gonna be doing 
uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna refresh my knowledge of the data set and data loader, and then get back to the building the neural network thing. And um, I'll stream again tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow we're gonna be looking into Autograd. I've looked into dude. Autograd is a very interesting subject. It's a very interesting system itself because like this thing, this this system is the reason why we don't have to do manual calculations of gradients and using those gradients to update the weights. And so we don't have to do those things manually. This system is the reason why we are able to have that happen automatically. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in reading up on this. Also, there's a PyTorch internals thing that one of the PyTorch devs had written. I, I remember I was reading it, but then I had to step away from that as well. I need to get back to reading that as well. But yeah, okay. Um, hold on for a second. Uh, you know what? I don't feel like sticking around and hanging out in anyone's stream today so i don't think i don't think i'm gonna raid anyone today i'm I'm just gonna carry on with this study stuff because i don't want to step away from this and like i usually like to stick around in someone's stream after i raid um so i don't think i'm gonna raid anyone today Or should I just raid Oz? Nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna relax. I'm gonna relax. You guys should go check out Oz though. Uh, Little Witch Oz. That's A U Z. Uh, go go check her out. She's cool people. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if anyone is here, but like if you are here, um. Hold on. Oh, great. There's an ad playing right now. Right, let's just wait for the ad to finish. All right, okay. Welcome back. I'm going to be ending the stream. Uh, I'm not raiding Oz because uh, I want to go do something else. And I usually like to, you know, stick around after raiding. I don't like raiding and raiding and leaving. Um, so I'm not going to be raiding her today, but I'm going to give her a shout out. If anyone is here, go check her out. Uh, I'm going to end.